What do you do with a voice like that? The story of extraordinary Congresswoman Barbara Jordan. Growing up in the Fifth Ward of Houston, Texas, Barbara Jordan stood out. She may have looked like other kids. She may have acted like other kids. But she sure didn't sound like other kids. Not with that voice of hers. That voice. That big, bold, booming, crisp, clear, confident voice. It caused folks to sit right up, stand up straight, and take notice. What do you do with a voice like that? Well, first you give that voice something to say. Barbara recited poetry at church. She memorized speeches for school. She entered oratory contests and in 1952 won a trip to Chicago, the first time she'd ever left Texas. Barbara was proud of herself and proud of her voice. It was laying a path for her. But where would that path lead? On Sunday evenings, Barbara would talk things over with Grandpa Patton. Would she become a preacher like her father? And like her mother could have been? Or a teacher, like those who encouraged her at Phyllis Wheatley High? Or perhaps she'd become a lawyer. Not many black women had achieved that. But one who had done so visited Wheatley and gave a stirring speech. Barbara was inspired. Being a lawyer would be a marvelous use of her voice. But before that can happen, what's the next thing you do with a voice like that? You give it more knowledge to work with. College opened Barbara's eyes to how the country was changing and how it wasn't. She learned how to find facts for herself debate important issues, defend good ideas, and dismantle bad ones. Her law classes challenged her more than anything she'd known. She hid her struggles from her classmates, studying long and hard and out of sight. And when she graduated, yes, Barbara became a lawyer. But being a lawyer bored her. She used a typewriter and pen a lot more than she did her voice and there was not enough work to occupy her time or her mind. There was, however, lots of political work that needed doing. In 1960, America was not as free or as fair of a place as it could be. Barbara believed that politics could change that, so she got involved. One night, a scheduled speaker was absent, and Barbara was asked if she would fill in. She said yes. The audience loved her. They trusted her. Most important, they were inspired to do something, to get out and vote, and to help round up others and get them to vote. Her voice had made a difference. Barbara, bitten by the political bug, as she later put it, knew just what to do with a voice like that. She put it to public use. Barbara wanted more justice and more equality. She knew that these things began with more citizens sharing their own voices with their representatives in government. To make sure they got heard, Barbara decided to run for political office herself. So she ran, and she lost. And she ran, and she lost. I have no intention of being a three-time loser, she said. She ran a third time. This time, she won. As a Texas state senator, Barbara represented the people she'd grown up among. Before, she'd merely trusted in the political system. Now she was part of it. When it works right, the system makes laws that improve our lives and to make sure that people, both the powerful and the powerless, follow those laws. Changes to our laws sometimes come from raising a ruckus outside the system, but Barbara's way was to make change from within. Sometimes that change, such as higher pay for farm laborers and more aid for people who got hurt at work, took place in public through debates on the Senate floor. 
Sometimes it didn't. Barbara got to know the other senators as individuals, and despite their differences, they came to relate to her in the same way. When each listened to what the other had to say, they could hear what was important to them, and it helped them all do a better job. Other Texans who had never paid any attention to women of color heard the wisdom in her voice, which helped them do better too. Well, then, what do you do with a voice like that? You share it with the entire country. In her next election in, 17, in 1972, Barbara moved up to the United States Congress in Washington, D.C. Soon came a troubled, confusing time for the nation. President Nixon, it seemed, had broken the law and Congress had to decide what to do about it. On a TV broadcast seen throughout the country, Barbara used her voice to show them the way. She reminded her audience that the Constitution is the document governing all the laws in the United States and applies to all of its people. Then, she explained, in her big, bold, booming, crisp, clear, confident tone, how the President's actions had gone against that document. My faith in the Constitution is whole. It is complete. It is total. I am not going to sit here and be an idle spectator to the diminution, the subversion, the destruction of the Constitution. The Constitution, Barbara said, must be preserved. The President, Barbara said, must go. The President went. That speech made Barbara a star. She shone like a bright light in a dark place. Barbara would have loved spending more nights under actual stars, camping and singing with her friends, but the public wanted more of her and more from her. She delivered, battling to protect the rights of Mexican-American voters and others against discrimination. There were whispers and rumblings of what might be next for Barbara. The U.S. Senate? The Supreme Court? Could she be possibly become Vice President Jordan? Who knew how high she might rise? So many people had so many hopes for Barbara. In her voice, they knew there was much to admire. How she spoke for those who had less power. How she spoke for those who possessed quieter strengths than her own. How she spoke for those who did not want to be limited by their weaknesses. But the public did not know that this last group included Barbara herself, who had been privately struggling with a nerve disease called multiple sclerosis since her earliest days in Congress. Nor did they know that Barbara had begun hearing another voice. This other voice was an inner voice. It instructed her that the right place for Barbara Jordan was not in any of the roles that the public had in mind. It told Barbara that the right place for her now was as a citizen back home in Texas. What do you do with a voice like that? Even as her body failed her, Barbara's mind grew ever wiser, and she heeded what she heard. She went home. There she became a teacher. College students who intended to put their own voices to public use lined up for the chance to learn from her. In her classroom, you can bet that they sat right up, stood up straight, and took notice of the values she imparted. Equality. Justice. Trust. Barbara used her voice to instruct and implore and inspire them, not just get out and do something, but to do the right thing. And when the occasion called for it, say... At a basketball game with students such as those she taught, students like Barbara herself once had been, she even used her voice to raise a ruckus. Barbara Jordan's former students still move among us, striving to do work that would have made her proud, hearing echoes of her words as they try to make life better for all of us, for when it has been silenced.
What do we do with a voice like that? We remember it and we honor it by making our own voices heard.